peace, bringing it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. Let your name still call the sea still, rage in me still every way. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, come on, Jesus. to me, Jesus. Breathe. Call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise. Breathe. Call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, your name, your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. our friends and our family. We're so glad that you tuned in this morning to worship with us. If you haven't done so already, please invite somebody to join with you. So wherever you're at, I hope that you are ready to worship, to lift the praise of the one true God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Silence is the 
This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how. This is how in my weakness you are strong I'm not alone I'm not alone I'm not alone You're before me and behind me You're all around me my God is for me. Good morning, Freedom Church. I have some exciting announcements for you today. Please go to our website so that you can register. Services will be in our main sanctuary and our youth sanctuary. On August 23rd, we are going to have our baptismal service. We can't wait to celebrate all of those who will be baptized this year. If you want to be baptized, you can go to our website and register there. This summer, Freedom Church is giving back to our community. We understand that parents are going into a new school season, and we want to help them out. We will be giving out parent packs filled with multiple school supplies. If you would like to be a part of this, you can donate Expo dry erase markers to fill the bags. Also, you can also donate a monetary gift. This will go towards things like printers and whiteboards. For more information of this, you can go to the website. Passports in the Park will start this Friday for all Freedom Kids. Parents, if you want to be a part of this, you can email our children's director, Candace Orton, or you can go to our website. This Wednesday, Nexus Student Ministry is going to be back in the building. We can't wait to have tons of fun and just gather as a family once again. So this Wednesday, Nexus students can come to the church at 645 for our first back in the building service. For more events or other signups, you can go to our website. For giving, you can also visit our website. And if you're looking for sermon notes, you can go to our website for that too. I hope you guys have an awesome service. Can't wait to see you soon. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Wherever you are, if you're tuning in online or LCTV, we are just so glad that you joined us. And if you don't know this already, we're back in the house. And so we're excited to be able to have church back inside. And if you're still wanting to stay home during the season, that's okay. We understand. That's why we're going to continue to bring this to you this way. But are you familiar with the phrase shooting from the hip? It's a phrase that pretty much means you make really quick decisions. Shooting from the hip isn't always a bad thing, but it's not always a great thing either. For example, shooting from the hip is okay when deciding which restaurant to go to. But shooting from the hip is not okay when choosing who you're going to marry. Shooting from the hip is okay when choosing which route to take to work. However, shooting from the hip is not okay when choosing to walk out on the job. And shooting from the hip is okay when choosing paper or plastic but it's not so okay when naming your child, right? Today we're going to continue week two of the series called Back on Track, and we're looking at the life of this man in the Bible named Nehemiah and some decisions that he made that were definitely weren't shooting from the hip. You know, last week Pastor Craig introduced us to the series and to this man who was grieving the Babylonian destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And in finding this information out, the Bible's clear to indicate that he wept, and in fact, as we continue in the story today, we will see that Nehemiah is clearly still upset months after hearing the initial news. And the end of chapter 1 tells us what Nehemiah's job title is, and that's that he's a, a cup bearer. And that doesn't just mean he walks around, you know, carrying the drink all day long, but it was actually a pretty important job. He was somewhat of a consultant to the king and actually would be highly trusted because he would not only choose what the king would eat and drink, but he would actually test it out first to make sure nobody had poisoned it. Talk, talk about a high-risk job. But it was a job in a position of influence, and really his life would have been pretty well taken care of in that position. 
Even though life on paper would have seemed good for Nehemiah, he was still grieving over his city. And his grief led him to prayer, to fasting, and to seeking the Lord for direction. Nehemiah didn't shoot from the hip. He didn't make a quick and foolish decision in the midst of his grief. And sometimes that can be us, can't it? Maybe you grieve over the condition of our nation right now. You grieve over the reports of COVID or the loss of a job or the loss of a job opportunity. Maybe you grieve the fact that you can't see loved ones that live in other states right now. Right? Sometimes our, we can make foolish decisions in the middle of our grief, though. How many of us have packed on the COVID-19? Staying home, no work, COVID everywhere, I'm just going to eat. Sometimes the things that, we, that grieve us, we use for excuse, excuses to feed our flesh even more. We rationalize that this is the only thing that's going to make me happy or feel normal, or I just need a break from all this crazy, and you go and do something crazy to feel like you're getting away from crazy. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Have you sought God in your grief, or have you complained? Have you asked him how you could be the answer, or have you bashed everything that's going on and everyone that's making decisions? Have you prepared a plan of action or just a defensive verbal attack? As we begin to read today and as you turn to Nehemiah chapter 2, I want to take a moment to explain that Nehemiah is serving a Persian king, a king who isn't necessarily favorable toward Jerusalem, and so Nehemiah's grief is shared only by him. But the position that he held is an important one, and at this point, he's just a cupbearer, a cupbearer bearing this grief and burden over his city. And maybe today as we read, some of us will feel like we are just whoever we are. You're just a mom, just a nurse, you're just a factory worker, just a senior citizen, you're just a teenager. Listen, don't let your just determine the way that you approach God. Maybe today we find that in our areas of grief or burden, God wants to do something amazing. So let's check it out in Nehemiah chapter 2, starting right in the first verse. It says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? And so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So just some context here as we jump in. In ancient courts, it was actually forbidden to be sad in front of the king. Actually, the king would have believed that just by being in his presence, that would fill you with great joy. Imagine that. But I imagine that Nehemiah was trying to do a good job of not looking sad, but four months of this is just too hard to hide any longer. So when the king asked him why he was sad, he recognized that he had done something forbidden. As the king didn't like his answer, the king may have just chosen to get a new cupbearer, and in doing so may have killed the one who was sad in his presence. A pretty tense situation. Now talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Not only is he upset, but now he is afraid, very much afraid, and his next response was literally life or death. And so he starts by honoring the king. This king had no plans to do anything for Israel. For years, Israel was rebellious toward Persia, And Nehemiah, being in such close proximity to him, would have known this well, but he chooses to honor him. He doesn't tell the king that the opposing political party is crooked. He doesn't tell the king what the king should do or change. He doesn't start screaming at the opportunity to speak to the king. He honors the king. Nehemiah had been spending time with the Lord, and obviously in this position he had learned how to speak well to this king. But I believe his time with God showed him not only how to honor his commitments, but how to order his life to the word of the Lord, as we see the way that he responded to the king here. And we all, we can all fall off track at times when we order our lives around, when our commitments, our desires, our pursuits, they can all fall off track as we begin to live for ourselves and not for him. Even in the midst of grief or pain, we want to look, look for ourselves. And one of the first ways that we can fall off track or out of order is this, is that we fail to honor those in authority over us. Regardless of if we like it or not, God has called us to honor people and honor our authority. 
And I know this is a tough one. We've allowed our opinions and even our convictions to supersede his word regarding this. Honor doesn't look like bowing down to every rule, but honor does mean to respect the position and the authority. 1 Peter 2 says it this way, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing so good, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. There's not much wiggle room in that scripture to say that we don't have to honor authority. And I can be guilty of this myself, where I start to question, or I start to doubt, or I even start to grumble when it comes to some of the authority that I see. Right? But I ask God to help me have a heart after him. And this is really where we die to our natural self, isn't it? It's pretty easy to complain. But Jesus is a great picture of responding to government and authority. Sometimes he just didn't. <laughs> or he'd respond with a question, but he never answered out of flesh, anger, or bitterness. Imagine if we put our natural responses aside, died to our own opinions, and honored according to the word of God. Nehemiah here, who had been four months long grieving, he still took time to honor the king. But then he goes in with the truth, and he tells the king of his grief. And so jumping right in, he, he tells the king what really is happening. His city has been destroyed, and no one's doing anything about it. But the king's response reveals the close relationship that Nehemiah had with the king, and the king asked pretty much what he needs to do to help Nehemiah out. It's crazy. <laughs> Could you imagine? One minute you're totally terrified, the next minute you have the opportunity to ask the king to restore a city that you love. Imagine that. It's what a little bit of honor can do, isn't it? So what did he do? He prayed. Yep, Nehemiah, he, he prayed. He got out a candle, turned on some worship music, you know, got, got, in, the, got in the mood and knelt down right before the, the king and began to pray. I'm just kidding, of course, it doesn't say that because that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? But how many times are we waiting for the right time to pray? How many times do we need to be in the right mood to pray to God? And how many times do we have, as Pastor Craig said last week, terms and conditions on our prayer life? Nehemiah is standing right now in front of the king, and instead of blurting out everything he wanted or needed, he took time to pray. And why? Because he's been building that prayer life and relationship with the Lord all along. Especially over these last several months, he had been praying and fasting for the city. He was developing in him a personal prayer culture that caused him to put his desires aside and seek the Lord. Nehemiah really shows us what it looks like to be led by the Lord and not just our emotions. And that's the next way that we can get off track is that we give our emotions more attention than God. Emotional responses are, are normal in life. They're not bad all the time. They're more indicators, but often especially in something that's grievous to us, we can let our emotions lead our actions. And usually it's with good intentions and trying to be helpful, but sometimes those good intentions can actually lead to bad results because they're not carried out with care or the blessing of God. So if we aren't careful, we'll continue to respond emotionally as opposed to responding according to God's will. It's because what we attend to is what we'll go back to. This is really true, and I, I know there's probably some green thumbs watching today. I myself am not a green thumb, and so in our house, Megan and I, we've never really had plants. We just killed them all. We are plant murderers. Uh, really, we're plant neglectors. And so we never attended to the plants that we had, and they all died. Well, guess what? We've reached a new level of adulthood at the Fresh household. Back in April for our anniversary, I asked Sarah Hull and her family to help me surprise Meg by building this plant shelf in our living room. And I'll be honest, I was a bit nervous because we got about 12 plants to start and I was afraid that these 12 plants would have a sad, short life. Not only are all 12 plants alive, but we've added two more since then. I'm so excited. We, we did something different this time. You know what it was? We actually attended to them. We watered them and saw them start to grow and so we kept watering them. It, it actually became fun to see how alive we could keep them. We talked... We actually still talk about it every day. Like, wow, can you believe we've actually allowed these plants to continue to grow? 
But what we attend to is what we'll go back to. We kept going back to those plants. We kept bringing water to them as they needed it. And if we're constantly attending to our emotions, sulking in grief, pursuing happiness by going from one thing to the next, or even giving in to anger, when push comes to shove, we're always going to go back to those emotions. But Nehemiah's emotions led him to prayer. His emotions pushed him to God, and Nehemiah attended to his relationship with the Lord so that in a split second, he was able to talk to God. Like, God was on speed dial. God was at the very top of his text, and as soon as he texted him, he saw that gray response bubble pop right up, meaning that God was talking back. Nehemiah had attended to this relationship with God so much that he was ready at a moment's notice to speak to him. And that's the kind of access that God wants us all to have. My prayer for you is that God would be on your speed dial, that you would begin to walk in such intimacy with him that at a moment's notice, you know exactly who to speak to, that you would be going throughout your day talking to God. I also pray that you would have those long, powerful prayer times where you're in your room and just spending time with him, cultivating an intimate prayer life that will radically transform your life. Also, I want us all to remember something about prayer that we see exemplified here, and that's that no prayer is too big or too small for the heart of God. Nehemiah took this moment to pray, and God strengthened him to respond, and he responded by asking the king to allow him to be the solution to the problem that he's facing. Really, all he does is ask the king for a release from duty, a, a temporary leave of absence, if you will, so that he can go and take care of business. Nehemiah was committed to the city and to the work of the Lord, and he was going to prove it by starting the work himself. And this is the way that we can fall off track. The next thing that we see is that we fail to ask the right questions. Have you ever seen the movie A Christmas Story? Well, in the movie, Ralphie, the main character, is trying to find ways to ask his mom for a Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas. He tries to be sly about it, sending little messages, even tucking an ad into his mom's magazine, and his heart is just set on this BB gun for Christmas. And one day, his mom asked him what you would like for Christmas, and he was afraid of the age-old, you'll shoot your eye out reply if he told her what he really wanted. So he thought quick and said, football. Yeah, I, I want a football. Immediately, he regretted his request because he knew he was falling short of what he really wanted. What he really wanted was a BB gun. But he was afraid of the response, so he asked for a football. He knew the right question, but asked the wrong one. The right question at the right time leads to the right response. And for Nehemiah, the right question was for, re for a release to be the solution. I think one of the things that made this question the right question is that he didn't just pre present another problem to the king. Right? As followers of Christ, we have access to God to ask him for anything. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. In close relationship with God, this verse becomes real. You begin to understand that God is ready for you to speak to him, even ask him questions. We don't have to be afraid to approach him with our needs or even our burdens. But one of the keys to Nehemiah's ask, I think, was that he wasn't just asking for himself. He wasn't just asking for the problem to be taken away. He knew the problem, but he also knew the solution. Problems are pretty easy to see, aren't they? It's really easy to distinguish a problem from something good. You can walk into a room and notice paint not done right, people not doing what they should, a floor not mopped well. But what if instead of just pointing out problems, we began to bring solutions? You see, God's gifted us with the power of his spirit. We have the power to be a solution in a world full of problems. Have you asked God to help you be the solution to the problem that's burdened you? What if we began to see our roles as followers of Christ to be problem solvers instead of problem complainers, right? The right ask is solution-oriented, not problem-oriented. So be the solution. God created us for such a time as this in such a place as this. We have to believe that. Let's stop looking to all the problems of the world and look to our God who is greater, who's already overcome the world and who has put us here to be his solution to a lost and dying world. Let's ask God for the strength to be that right now. Lord God, you promised trouble in this life, and Lord, you also said that you would overcome that trouble. Lord, I ask that right now you would help us to be your hands and feet, to be the solution to the problems that this world faces. God, strengthen our hearts and encourage us to know that you are in control, Lord God, and Lord, that we can help be the solution today.
God, I thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be strong today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are created to be the solution. So look at your neighbor or look at someone in your house or text someone and tell them, let's be the solution together. You see, all along, Nehemiah was committed to his city, to the king and to the Lord and to what God was calling him to do. His commitment had to come first, and then it was time for a plan of action. And so let's continue on in our story uh, in verse 6. It says, And the king said to, said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I had asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. So have you ever had a solution? You got a problem, and, you, and you're working on a solution, and it just gets bigger and bigger, and it, it becomes, you know, building a city. It's like you're making plans for the weekend, and you just throw in there, rebuilding Jerusalem. No, for real. Like, have you and your spouse ever... Uh, try to make plans, and it felt like you were doing just that. Come on, you know how it goes. Well, what are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to get there? Do you even know how long that's going to take? Do you know how much money that's going to be? Nope, that's it. We can't do it. Let's just go back home and call it a day. Have you ever been there? The king asked Nehemiah how long he'll be gone, and it says that the king was pleased to send him when he had given him a time. He had a plan. He, it was a big plan, but it was still a plan. Talk about favor. But also talk about that plan. Talk about knowing the calling of God. It would have been possibly easy to just head to Jerusalem in his own emotional strength, but Nehemiah didn't do that. Instead, through his yielding to the Lord, God used his position as a means to help him get to Jerusalem. And that's true. God's willing to use your job description as you walk in your calling. God can use anything and anybody to fulfill his plans. Don't forsake where you are right now. He's willing to use the gifts and talents that he's put in you to help you fulfill your calling. Nehemiah's intimacy with the Lord revealed that this burden was more than just a burden. It truly was a calling. And sometimes the area of our burden can be the area of ministry that God's calling us to. I think of so many missionaries who are burdened for the lost and unreached people groups in the world that waited on the Lord and made a plan to serve him by going. And this is one of the ways that we can get back on track is that we, we wait on our calling. We don't go searching for other opportunities. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, the calling on our lives is being created by Christ is to do good. We talked about that a lot as a ministry staff lately in our church in this season. We feel as though God is asking us to do good in this world. We can keep it simple, but how can we just simply do good? Now, that's why we're handing out parent packs later this month to bless families as they transition back to school this fall. It's simple, but it's good. Right? God hasn't called us to be opportunistic Christians. We live in a land of opportunity, so I understand that it could be hard to not want to chase every opportunity that comes our way. But not every opportunity is for us. Not every shiny object is ours to obtain. And I know a lot of times we can complain about where we live in our own city. We don't like the snow. We don't like that there isn't a Starbucks or a Target in town. People say there's never anything to do, right? We've all heard that complaining happening, and our complaining sometimes can lead people to look for new opportunities, new places, new faces, and new experiences. But not every opportunity is a good one to take. Again, shooting from the hip is okay if you're looking for a place to eat, but it's not okay when you're looking for a place to live. Shooting from the hip is okay when wondering which one of the many nature trails to walk down, but it's not okay when considering uprooting your life. And it happens. People leave and they come back. Leave and come back. I'm one of those people. I left and I came back. Parents leave to be with their kids. Kids leave to get away from their parents. They leave and they come back. Why? Because you're chasing an opportunity, you aren't waiting on your calling. Maybe the city that we live in is, is just waiting for you to seek God to be the solution. Maybe you're the one that's going to help rebuild what's been taken away. 
And that can be applied to whatever city you're in or where you're watching right now. Listen, your calling isn't going to make you crazy or miserable. You don't have to worry about God sending you to Africa. If that is his plan, there's likely a chance that he'll begin that work in your heart before he puts you on that plane. But God will bring opportunities to your life, things you never thought he would. He's not into playing games or giving all these signs and, and different things for you to interpret and waiting for the stars to align. No, we need to align our hearts with God to better hear his voice and direction. It's really, that, that's the key. We need to align our hearts with God to better hear his voice and direction. Nehemiah did this as he spent four months developing uh, just this, this, this prayer life, which really he had beforehand, but these four months of grief when he found out about the city. And then God opened the opportunity for him to speak to the king about this burden that he was holding on to. And as you do that, you can get back on track by doing this, and that's developing a clear and strategic plan. See, through the prayers and everything else like that, God set a plan in motion, and God is a planning God. The Bible says that he hovered over the darkness before creating the earth. He certainly doesn't just shoot from the hip. Psalm 33, 11 says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart throughout all generations. See, there's a blessing in having a plan. You can't change the world and just hope for something to happen. And that's why Clark Kent always had his Superman suit on and ready, which I do too. But he was ready for everything. He had a plan to be a difference. And I know that in the season it's been difficult to plan or to have plans. Believe me, I'm a planner. And this season has completely wrecked all of that. Even with coming back inside the church, I'm so excited who we had planned for next week, and even that got switched. So it's difficult to, to make plans, but it takes faith to plan, to know that God is in the plans and that the plans will follow through. We don't always know that up front, but one thing I know is that faith is not a substitute for good planning. It's not super spiritual to walk into something blind and just wait for the Holy Spirit to come and move in a big way. Planning with Christ and in faith leads to provision. Proverbs 21, 5 says that the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Now, I remember a story that I heard once at a Christian concert. It was from one of the speakers for Compassion Child, and I don't remember all of the details, but the speaker would tell the story about a mom and her young son in a remote village in Africa. And they would go on and, and tell how they would go day to day not knowing whether they would eat or where their food would come from. But each morning this mom would send her son out to get firewood and he would spend much of the morning collecting this wood. And after he was tired and was coming back home, he looked at his mom and asked why she kept sending him if they didn't know if they would have food or not. And her response was, because we need to be prepared to cook the food that I'm believing God will provide. Sometimes it's a matter of being prepared. That's faith, right? That, that we don't need to know every answer, every situation right away, but we need to be pre prepared for God's provision and for God's direction. Nehemiah's plan was to not only ask the king for a temporary leave of absence, but then to ask for protection and provision as he asked for letters to pass through the region and letters for supplies. His plan was clear and it was bold. Months of growth happened through the through his grieving, and he knew what God was calling him to do. And God does always have a plan. And he uses things in our lives to help us grow, even pain. So don't forsake that pain or the season of life that you're in. Submit it to the Lord and watch what he can do. So many times we want to live our lives according to what we want, according to our plans, and according to staying safe, not risking anything, and holding on to as much as we can. Our lives get so off track when we continually feed our flesh instead of developing our spiritual lives. And living in both worlds is a dangerous place to be. God isn't asking us to hold on to worldly things. He's asking us to live submitted to him. So you go from holding to surrendering. And when we do that, he will provide our needs. Even when it comes to our plans, do we shoot from the hip or do we wait on the Lord? And that's the next way we can get back on track is by waiting on the Lord and submitting to him. Now, this isn't contradictory to the last point. Waiting on the Lord looks like seeking the Lord for these plans. It looks like letting God walk you through a process of dying to yourself, developing a heart like his, and then showing you the way that he wants you to walk it out. 
Nehemiah waited and waited and waited. And when the time finally came for him to do what he believed God had called him to do, he was ready. He was so ready. It was like every piece of the puzzle fit together and every detail was aligned for what he had to do next. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, you'll find several occasions where Nehemiah prayed and fasted. Through seasons of difficulty, we find him submitting his life to God and waiting on him. Proverbs 3, 5 says that if we trust in the Lord with all your, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. You see, that's what submitting looks like. It looks like not, not, not trusting in your own strength, trusting in him, not trusting in the government. Right? Not trusting in your family, not trusting in your school, not trusting in Google or Alexa or Siri. Trust in the Lord and he'll straighten you out. Right? That's, that's his promise. He'll make your path straight. He'll show you the way that he's trying to lead you in life. Nehemiah's trusting in the Lord led him straight to Jerusalem. But he wasn't going blind. He was going with the favor of the Lord. And he was clear to point out that it was the favor of the Lord that allowed him to speak to the king and not to be killed by the king and even to request a leave of absence, protection, and materials from the king to be able to go. As we wait on the Lord, we need to be ready to go. We need to take action. Nehemiah didn't just develop the plan and ask the king and then wait. He didn't second guess what God was asking him to do. He didn't second guess his abilities or the Lord's. He went. Submitting to God looks like going when he asks us to go, speaking when he asks us to speak, and loving when he asks us to love because the church on the move is a church that's taking ground back for the kingdom. And the enemy isn't afraid of a planning Christian. He's afraid of a Christian who's moved to action. It's time to commit our works to the Lord and let him lead our lives, not us or any other opinions. And the last way that we get back on track is this, is that we prevent outside opinions from throwing us off track. It isn't always wise to go spreading your plans and ideas all around. Why? Because people have opinions. And unfortunately, many times we allow other opinions to influence us. Not always negatively, but sometimes we can actually sabotage ourselves when we speak to several different people. And usually what we're doing is we're either looking for justification or support in what we're trying to do. And in Nehemiah, as you go down verse 12, it says that I arose in the night and I and a few men with me and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. You see, this verse says that he went with a couple men but told no one what God had told him to do. Nehemiah wasn't even willing to give opportunity for outside opinions to come into what God had called him to do. Wise counsel is a good thing, so don't hear what I'm not saying there. God has put people in our lives to help be that wise counsel, but spreading it out everywhere for everyone is not the wisest thing. And we live in a world of social media, right? Social media has created a platform for everyone's news to be spread far and wide. And this has also caused internet trolls, people on the internet that really only intend to harass people, to rise up. And they, they mock people, they harass, they do different stuff. But that's because there's so much stuff out there. And so it just propels that. The opinions of the world will come as you put your information out there. And people still put stuff up and allow these trolls to come in and, and, and try to harass them. And if you think about it, trolls really, they would stop you from crossing into new territory. They just want to mess with you and stop you in your tracks. See, God's calling the church to expand territory. And the enemy would like nothing more than to th try to throw you off track using even opinions from other people. And it's just as much as we don't want outside opinions from influencing us, we need to be careful about giving our opinions too. Right? We need to be careful to not allow our personal burdens to become everybody else's. But as we've talked about today, God's called you to be the solution. See, Nehemiah went all in with his commitment to the Lord. He didn't rally the troops. He didn't allow outside opinions from influencing him. He went all in and trusted the Lord all the way. Our lives, they can get off track when we start to allow other opinions and other things to influence our decisions. When we begin to sit back when, when God has called us to move, our lives can get off track when we allow our emotions to lead instead of God's desires and God's opinion. Today, let's make a decision that we're going to recommit our plans to the Lord. We're going to allow God 
to set the course for the life that he wants us to walk in. Not our emotions, not our opinions, not even our desires, but God. Because that, that's how he changed the world. God's created you to be a solution in this world that we live in. So today, let's take a moment to recommit to him. Let's not wait any longer for the right conditions. Let's just wait on Christ. Today is the day to give Christ a fresh yes to to recommit and to follow him. And so let's commit to being that solution. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are in the details. God, that you are a planning God. And Lord, I believe that you have put each and every one of us here for such a time as this and in such a place as this. Lord God, I pray that we wouldn't look to all of the the problems that are facing the world and God, that we would look to you as the solution. God, that we would look to you to use us to be a part of that solution. And God, I pray that you would strengthen us according to your word. Lord, to be able to ask the right questions. God, to be able to walk out in faith the plans that you've put on our hearts. And God, I pray that you would help us to see you in the midst of all of it. Lord, cultivate that that relationship, that intimacy with you, Lord God. Lord, that at any moment we know that you are ready to talk to us. God, that you have an ear ready to listen. God, I thank you that that is who you are. That's your character, and we don't have to doubt that. Lord, I pray today that your will would be done and your kingdom would come on this earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, that you would use us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Every day in your hands, you were there before time began. Sovereign one, I rest in your place. my soul and love. 